very much looking forward to this. Uh, we are live, Keith McCormick and Dean Abbott. We're going to be talking about machine learning. We're going to be taking your questions. It should be a lot of fun. So as we get settled, please let us know that you're out there and in comments. Uh, if you've ever been on a, on a StreamYard live show, uh, I see Dean, he sees me, we see your comments, but that's it. So that's the way to tell us that you are out there and listening. So uh, for those of you that don't uh, know us, uh, Dean and I have known each other for a number of years. I think we have, I was doing the math, Dean, I think we have 60 years uh, between us. So um, I'm at Cloud Factory. Dean is at Smarter HQ. And I'm sure biographical details will come up uh, a little bit as we go, but I want to jump right into it because we have a big topic and a lot of really interesting things to talk about. So number one uh, question I wanted to ask, let me take a quick look at comments here. We have some folks joining. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. Okay, but here's the first topic I want to start with, Dean. So, you know, we're forever hearing this incredibly pessimistic information about deployment rates at, you know, the, the kinds of everyday businesses that we have worked at for years, uh, organizations large and small, banking, manufacturing, and so on. And I hear crazy numbers like 5% of models being deployed. Uh, so kind of want to ask you a two-part question. Does that resonate with your experience? And if so, what what is going on with deployment? Well, first of all, it's just, I'm so happy to be a part of this, Keith. Like, like you mentioned, Keith and I have conversations like this on our own fairly regularly. So this is just an extension of the kind of things we talk about uh, when we have uh, conversations every uh, month or two or three. Uh, and we've had over the 10 years or so we've known each other. So it's a real pleasure to be a part of this. In terms of deployment, it, it's funny when you brought that up because it depends on who you're talking to, whether deployment is a big problem. Because when you talk to kind of the 10,000 foot level, you hear, oh, machine learning is really easy. Hmm. You know, just, you know, you plug it in, you get Python and scikit-learn or R, you build some models, you deploy it, and you print money. But then when you talk to practitioners, that's especially where you see those numbers, like the 5%, 10%, 30%, really low numbers. And so it's it's frustrating from a data scientist perspective uh, because you put all this work, you think you do something good, and nothing happens. And so it does resonate. I've seen the same kind of phenomena throughout my career of you know, 60 divided by two plus or minus uh, that I've been building models. So it's it's definitely a real factor. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I'm sure we'll dive into. What would you say would be the the number one? Well, let me set up, let me set up the question again. <laughs> I think the reason is because we're here to talk about, you know, return on investment and again, trying to get business value out of the machine learning models that we build. And I think it is fair to say that your chances of getting return on investment on your machine learning model if you fail to deploy is almost nil. But people will make claims that, you know, if you get some really powerful insight out of exploring the data, but boy, it's really hard to measure that. So I, I think we yeah. are probably kindred spirits on this count that you really have to get the darn thing into production if you're going to get ROI from it. And um, want to welcome everybody. And again, I want to urge you to put in comments who you are and where you're joining from because, uh, uh, that is our main insight into who is joining us at the um, at the moment. But you know, in my in my role at Cloud Factory, one way to think of it is that we're in many ways very deployment focused. We also, you know, help people with their uh, set up their training data sets. Certainly, but if folks are familiar with the phrase "human in the loop," for a lot of our client companies, we're the human in the loop. So uh, that's why today we're you know we're really focused on deployment. So where do you think? some of these companies go wrong. I agree with you, it's a big topic, but what yeah. would you kind of put at the top of the list? I'll mention two things, I think the top two. Number one is, uh, and, and they, the problems are always at the beginning of the project, or almost always at the beginning of the project. Sometimes you don't realize it until the end because at the beginning of the project, you didn't do enough due diligence or things, sometimes things just surprise you. But at the beginning of the project, the number one reason I see projects fail is that the objectives were not clearly laid out. And so you, you get there and, and maybe a project manager is leading the effort 
and maybe this is the first time uh, a model like this has ever been envisioned. And so they're seeing all the potential, which is just fantastic. I love seeing that. But then if you don't have the right people in the room, and I talk about the three-legged stool of successful analytics, James Taylor, who I know you'll have on in the future, uh, he and I talk, use the exact same analogy where you need the subject matter expert in the room, the project manager, you need the data infrastructure people who know where the data lives, what it means, how to access it, and the data science piece or the analytics piece, someone who knows what to do with the data. And if you don't have all three in the room at the beginning of the project, uh, just like a three-legged stool, one leg goes away, it, it falls over, things fall over. So for example, one of the things that's happened to me is the project manager and the data people talk about uh, the machine learning models that uh, they need to build and they define everything, the project up front, and then they bring in the consultant or they bring in the machine learning people to just make it happen. And it takes, first of all, the machine learning people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't understand the context and I don't understand exactly how to get the data. And then they start building the data and the data is not in the right form to do machine learning on. Like uh, one of the ways that this may seem super obvious to everyone here, but m all machine learning algorithms use data that's two dimensional. So you've got rows and columns and that's it. And it's not relational. And I've had that problem where they say, well, we got all this data. Well, there's no way to connect all these pieces together because we don't have keys to join the data in the database from. So the project fails. There's no way to get there. And then we got to come up with a new problem. So that's just one example of it. Well, you know, uh, Dean, you, you also mentioned the word that I think is so important. You said beginning at the beginning of the project. So I think one of the things that um, um, I wrote in a recent article um, in preparation for today is that you can know from the very, very beginning that you're not going to be able to get a model that can handle every possible circumstance. And that's because you've gotten the people in the room that you just described at the beginning. Mm -hmm. A trend that I see so often is folks just gather all the data, I mean, everything. They throw it at the machine learning algorithm, and then they figure that they'll invite the subject matter expert and the line of business into the room after the model is built. The mm -hmm. feeling is, hey, once we have a model built, uh, we'll have a better job. I just want to greet uh, a couple of folks. We have Carol joining us from Nepal and Adrian joining us from the UK. Um, lots of folks, uh, Sally also from the, uh, the UK. I do want to make a quick comment uh, logistically to help us find your questions. I spot a couple of questions already and we're very fired up to talk about that. What you can do is put question, write the word question and then write your question. It will help us spot it quickly um, in the feed. So what do you think about this notion where throw everything at the model and then figure it out? Uh, we yeah. both know that's a disaster. But why do you think people were tempted to do it? Well, because I think people uh, who understand the data, you know, who have lived the data, they know all the nuance, all the complexity of things going in. They just want to bring everything to bear uh, to to cover all the permutations. Whereas I think it's better for machine learning to be more nimble, more agile, to put it in kind of a modern context and make incremental improvements. So you have a baseline right now that your models or your decision-making is achieving. Your goal is to improve on that, is to make your business more efficient, more profitable. To you, So you don't have to hit a, the way, to use the baseball analogy, you don't have to hit home runs. You just have to hit singles. And you can keep on uh, improving those models over time. That feedback loop to improve the models is so critically important because most of the time, especially if it's your first time building a model as an organization, or the first time you've brought these uh, decision makers or project managers into the process, it's hard to understand all that you're going to need and all the nuance that goes into a machine learning model. And so it's better to get a little ways down the road correct, you know, and not, not to throw all the data. Here's, here's a dumping ground of all the data. Here's the, uh, the data lake. Go at it. You know, and then you're just picking through garbage to try to find something interesting to you know, get something that's easier and make some improvement first and then iterate, add, em enhance. 
You know, um, I think as you described that, Dean, I think the trick is the way we're describing iterate and the way others are might be quite different. Let me see if uh, let me see if you agree. So what a lot of folks would do is say, throw everything at the model, run the model, you get 81% accuracy. Then let's go back and throw all the data again and try a different algorithm. Maybe now we haul out, you know, XG Boost or something, a more powerful algorithm. And sometimes that's seen as the incremental improvement. I think the more helpful way for the audience to envision this would be something like a classic, you know, almost 80s example of this, something like a cell phone churn, where you might have voluntary churn, famous thing where someone's choosing to leave to go to another company, but then you might have involuntary churn, which is basically collections. Mm -hmm. Rather than throwing all the data in, take the collections cases out because you already have a system in place to yep. handle that. Yeah, um, And that's the incremental improvement I think people are missing out, which is you can identify the special cases up front, remove them from the modeling process, and let the machine learning algorithms do what they're good at, but preserve the human processes that are already in place and don't reinvent the wheel until you're ready to circle back and, and get efficiencies in another area in the business. People, I think people, in other words, forget that we're solving problem for people that work in organizations. You yeah. know, we're not doing algebra. There might be a lot of fancy math under the hood, but we're solving people problems. So we wanna take these, well, another way to think of it is um, there might be a couple of Silicon Valley startups that are truly doing something new, but most companies that we've seen in our career have existing processes that they're trying to improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because sometimes what I see happen is there's, when we're talking about iterating, I'm thinking about, especially on data, uh, data elements you bring into the model and features you create from, uh, from those data elements. That's what I'm thinking primarily. The, uh, the question about iterating through algorithms is an interesting one, and that's worthy of a separate discussion. Uh, but focusing on the data and building the data and what data you use, that's because, you know, we've seen all those studies and uh, our experience, you know, data preparation you know, is like two thirds or three quarters or 90% of your time. And the, the problem is integrating data and then cleaning up data. The more elements you have, uh, the more time generally it takes to clean up that data. And so sometimes starting with a smaller data set, a narrower, not as many columns to, and, and take like the heavy hitters and, and building models from those first is helpful. Let me give you an example. As I used to uh, go in and build models for a, um, I can't say who, but an, an, an international newspaper that you've all heard of. And I would literally go in Monday morning, would have to have a model deployed by Friday afternoon that was operational. So I've got one week and those were uh, crazy weeks. But what were you you predicting? Triage. Dean, what were you predicting? We're, there's a whole bunch of things. One of the things we're predicting at one point was what content should go in an email to try to engage uh, the readers further. Other models were how do we uh, transition readers from being online consumers to signing up for the uh, monthly digital service. So those are two different kinds of models. But they had a lot of data elements that we could have included. Some which were obviously going to be useful, some maybe would be useful, some had a ton of missing data, some were really messy. And so as I was assessing the data we had at the beginning of the week, I would make decisions over which elements I'm going to include in my first path of the pass of the model so that I could get something out that would be good enough to use for them in deployment. If I had more time, then I would start adding in more elements to see if I can uh, improve by another one, two, three percent. But those kind of decisions help the organization because it's it's really easy for researchers, for all of us who are trying so hard to build the best model possible, to just put our head down, be in the weeds, and you could spend months. There's, there's no end to interesting questions to answer about the data. And so to try to emerge from those depths, to push something out that's useful so you could learn about what the model is doing well, what the model is doing poorly, so that you can iterate your model improvement once you get some real feedback on what the uh, accuracy of the model is in production. The newspaper example, I think, is very helpful, Dean, because, again, you're defining increment in a way that's different than I think most um, 
you know, rookie data scientists might. They're picturing incremental improvement and getting that accuracy to sneak up a tenth of a point at a time. But what you were basically saying is you get something like text. You and I have been on numerous text mining projects. We know how complicated those are. Try to build the model without the NLP, because we, we know what happens if you don't do it. If you get too ambitious early on, you turn what should be a six month project and you only had a week. You turn a six month project into a two year project because you insist upon doing everything on the first pass. Try to build the model without the text and then add the text in as a second model, which reminds me of one of the case studies I know that we wanted to talk about. Um, this was an example that we both um, kind of know the folks about have to talk about somewhat vaguely the uh, you know the special forces um, example, but basically looking at personnel records and uh, just to kind of set it up, and then you can comment a bit on on what the modeling process was like. This was something that was done by humans, human employees of this organization. They were going through and reading this, so they wanted to get things more efficient. But I remember because I happened to be in the room for one of these conversations. And I said, you know, it's probably the case that the models can be able to handle this about 90, 95% of the time, but not 100% of the time. And yeah. everybody, I'm sure you had some more conversations with them, everybody kind of looked down and broke eye contact and said, oh my gosh, we're not going to get to 100%. That's mission failure. Mm -hmm. But we had to kind of, you know, you have to educate clients like that a little bit because if you could comment a little bit on that choice what it would be like if you insisted upon having that project to go to 100%, it might drag on and never finish, I guess would be part of the answer. But why stop at 90? Why is it the better decision? Why is it ultimately more, not only more cost effective, but more productive to be realistic about what the model can do? Yeah, because you're always trying to improve what your organization is doing now. So that's, that's really the baseline. So like when I used to do... Um, a lot of customer analytics stuff in retail and, and things like that. The baseline was always like a random, like mailing to people at random. And those were easy to beat because you can always beat random, right? But most organizations are doing something relatively intelligent, smart right now. You've got experts who are making these selections. Uh, you've got some good rules in place. But if you can improve, you know, 10%, over what it's doing right now, you may save, you know, you can compute how much money will you save? How many more guys for special forces, the models that I was uh, first involved with are trying to identify who will make it through training so they knew who to recruit. And so if you could take this pool of so many people that it had a lot of washouts, and if you could say in this smaller pool, instead of getting like a 20% success rate, we could have a 30% success rate because there's a lot of, monetary investment in all of these trainees, all these candidates, because you've got to uh, work with them. You go through pre-selection uh, training. Uh, you're, they're going through, they're taking up slots, physical slots during the training. And so it's, it costs a lot of money to do that. So if you could, re basically, if you could chop out the ones that are very, very unlikely to make it, things that may not be so obvious to a recruiter, looking at them because a lot of times it's a multi-dimensional effect uh, that they're, you're looking at. It takes two or three or four different characteristics that you're measuring to identify that they're really not a good candidate. And that's harder for a person to do, to see all that. Let's, let's so clarify. If you can that with the models, then you make it the process more efficient. Yeah, go ahead. Let's clarify that for, for everybody, just so they can help picture this. So what you're basically saying is you want to use both structured data and unstructured data. But it's not only that the machine learning model is helping you process that unstructured data, is that you're getting interactions. That's the term that we, of course, would use for that. You're getting interactions between these variables, and it's difficult for the human to catch that. So you let the machine learning model do what machine learning models are good at, which is to find the interactions. But sometimes its ability to retrieve something from the unstructured data fails. Yep. And that's when you want to route it to a human who might simply have to read a paragraph. Uh, in fact, uh, do you have an example that comes to mind from that particular project? Because, you know, it really it sounds like college admissions, probably to most folks, because that's what it's really, really similar to. You've got mm -hmm. documents and structured data, and you're trying to decide if this person's going to graduate. It's just the graduation yeah. in this case is a little different. 
And so there's one example, when we were building these models initially, we're, I was doing it internally through um, through the organization I was contracting doing this with. Uh, there was an external organization that was also building these models uh, that was, and again, I'm not gonna name them, but as well-known organization, you all know who they are. Um, but they were building models, and here's the, here's the issue at work here. Uh, when somebody's going through this kind of selection process, the two most the two obvious outcomes are they either make it or they fail. You know, so and they fail most often. They fail. It's because they just quit. You know, they kind of ring out. You know, in the Navy SEAL way of doing. You, there's that image of them ringing out and then they leave. Uh, but there's actually a third outcome, and the third outcome is they get injured or for some other reason they roll. So they get taken out and then they can re-enter into another class later. So this other organization, when they're building these models, because they're building logistic regression models, they only want to look at two outcomes. Because of that, they miss some important characteristics which helped when you class up. And one of those was run scores, how, how quickly they could run and how effective they were good at distance running. Hmm. And it turned out, that those with poor run scores were more likely to have medical issues during training and uh, that would force them to be a, a medical role to go out and come back in. But they completely yeah. missed it because that was that third outcome. So when we're building our models, I see one of the questions, what models did you use? We ended up using Chade models for a lot of these uh, assessments because their decision trees are interpretable, rule-based, and Chade can have multiple outcomes, multiple level outcome variables. So you can have all three possibilities in the model. And so we could find branches of the tree that said, oh, yeah, here's the pattern associated with roles. And then that would help them uh, prepare those candidates better before they class up so they would be less likely to roll. So that wasn't an immediate reason for building the models, but that fell out of the analysis. And that was something that was really helpful for them to understand what was going on with these guys going through. You know, um, Adrian has a question, Dean, that I think is going to help us underscore what you were just talking about in this whole iteration business. He says, so what's the key? Build, train, deploy, and then adjust. I would I would phrase it a little bit differently. What I would say is you might go into this project. Well, a rookie model builder, what they might do is they might say, pass, fail, medical. What was the, you said there was a- Those are those three. Roll, yeah. roll, roll over. Well, you, yeah. you said- And, you uh, said and roll the over. Uh, medical roll, that's a roll, right. What what uh, what a lot of rookies would do, I think you'd, uh, you'd agree, Dean, is what a lot of, uh, what they would do is they grab that four category outcome and throw everything at that four category outcome. Mm -hmm. And again, that's, that's kind of the boil the ocean approach that we're recommending against. So what you might initially do is just do go, no go, you know, pass fail as the military. Right, because that's, that's really what they're interested in. Who's gonna make it, who's yeah. not gonna make it. But that's but not the way their structure worked. Their structure yeah. had those, is actually three potential outcomes. Yeah. And so, and I didn't know, it's not like I went in there an expert in this. I went in there and talked to the subject matter experts about what the process was, what happens, and I would look at the data and I'd say, what, is it? what are these roles? What are, tell me about them. And so they told me about them and I was like, oh, well, that's a legitimate outcome. I'm going to include that in the models because it's, and maybe it does nothing. Maybe I don't learn anything from that, but it turned out in this case, there was a very important part of that. You could even try it as a separate model, right? Because, you know, one of the themes that we're talking about today is that effective model building is like triage, where you're routing things to different places. So now I'm not saying that this would have been the best bet on that project. You, you could try it, but you could conceivably have a go, no go model, a medical model and a rollover model. Yeah. And you could sew those together later, but you could have propensity scores for each. And that's yeah. closer to what we mean by incremental improvement. Incremental improvement isn't throw everything in, get feedback, go back and try again and try again. In other words, that's to me, that feels like hitting your head against the wall, but rather trying to simplify the question, tackle a smaller part of the problem and then move on, which sometimes means that the part that you've set aside the edge cases, the unusual, maybe you let that continue to be a human driven process for the time being until you can achieve ROI on your first model and start to add the complexity over time. Right, and part of it, when you look at the models, you, it's almost never the case 
that my final metric of success is correct, 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 uh, correct classification, PCC or something like that, because there's almost always nuance involved. So like in this case, one of the things we definitely wanted to make sure that these models do is pick out, because we would back test these on prior classes to see, did we pick out who made it through and who didn't make it through? And there's some people that the community knew who these people were. And if we miss someone who made it through and was a really good operator, the question would be, why did the models miss that? What was what did that person have that the models didn't see? And that could mean enhancing the data differently. It could mean different uh, in increased numbers of variables. It could mean weighting uh, the the sampling differently. There's there's different ways you could achieve accuracy to make sure you get the ones that it absolutely needs to get correct and the one that absolutely needs to get that we're washing out. Make sure it gets those. There's squishier middle ones that everyone would, because we would always say, I would, I would talk to the trainers and ask them, what do you see that's going on? Why do the guys wash out? And they give me their theories. And when we could talk about individuals and say, what happened with this person? What happened with this person? And sometimes they just wouldn't know because there are things going on that you don't have data immediately available to see. You know, some of the psychometrics or, uh, some of their history maybe is not revealed just by what their physical status was when they came in, like how many push-ups and sit-ups could they do and pull-ups and run scores, swim scores, all that kind of stuff. Or yeah. what sports, we looked at sports they were involved with uh, in high school or college, what kind of awards did they get? But then later when we're trying to uh, assess this better, we're starting to introduce new variables to try to capture these effects. Things like there's a fascinating this fascinating research around a concept called grit. You know, Angela Duckworth from UPenn was doing a lot of uh, research in this. Can you measure someone's persistence? And you can. And so to, to know that upfront really helped uh, understand what was going on with some of these guys. Well, again, I think you're helping redefine what iteration is for the audience, right? And I think everybody can tell already that when we get together, we're dangerous. We could talk about this uh, all afternoon. But to kind of summarize what what I heard you explaining was that you had some false negatives, I guess would be the category they fell into. The model said they were going to do okay, but they actually washed out. So you went to the instructors and then you don't simply go back to the modeling phase. You go back to the data prep phase because now you have identified something that was missing and you have to add more data. And that adding more data could mean doing more work with unstructured. It could mean looking at documents. It could be creating a wider, not necessarily a taller, but a wider training data set to incorporate these variables. So you have to do, in other words, you have to do the work. When you go back to iterate, you're not going to get a better model just because it's Tuesday. You're going to get a better model because you went back, talked to the subject matter experts again, expanded the width of your data set, and then tried to model again, which um, I I love this example that we're on. And I'd I'd like to talk more about what they would spot when they uh, when there was an exception like that, like the kinds of conversations you had with the subject matter experts. But in the interest of time, I want to talk about our second case study. Uh, we have so many that we could talk about, but the um, the trucker invoices, this is, uh, people are going to think this sounds like the most mundane thing, and the most interesting models often are seemingly mundane, but what I love about this example is I, I really want to focus on that squishy middle that you've been talking about, mm-hmm. you know, where the model sometimes is really solid, and it's got 80% chance that this is a good one, so if you can explain a little bit about what you were trying to predict on that project, when the model was working, what it was accomplishing, but what that squishy middle was all about, and then what a human would have to do to put it in the right bucket. Yeah, so this is, it really was an interesting application. This was a local company in San Diego, relatively small company, and what they did was they bought invoices from truckers. Uh, so, like, you know, a trucker has a delivery to Walmart or something like that. So hmm. they're delivering cargo there, and then Walmart would pay uh, that invoice net 30 or something. But some of these truckers, they need the cash earlier because, you know, they're out that money. So this company would go in and buy invoices and pay, you know, whatever percentage, some very, very high percentage. They they would hold back a small percentage of the invoice to cover expenses and um and if the invoice wasn't paid fully, because sometimes the truckers would deliver something, there would be an invoice, but then uh, the invoice would be knocked down 
uh, later because there would be breakage or spoilage uh, of perishable items. So what this company did was they bought the invoices. So this was a very human intensive company because Let they- Let me stop you for a second, Dean, because I just want to, uh, people have probably heard the ad, you know, uh, I want my money now. <laughs> we don't have to say the brand name. They probably heard it. You know, they just sing, they sing that over and over again. I want my money now. Right. That's usually structured settlements, usually legal or medical in some ways, but this is a similar company but for truckers that have these big invoices that could be 50, 80, 100 grand, and they need that money now because fuel, repairs, whatever it might be. Is right, that, exactly. Somebody? And so they would contact this, this company and uh, they would there would be an application they'd have to fill out and a person would look at this application and approve or not approve. So you're banned limited by how many applications individual people can go through so the idea was this can we build machine learning models to identify who is uh whose uh, invoices are good to purchase and whose are not and obviously the what we would love is if you could completely automate this so you just send in the invoice online application it goes in approve or not approve the problem is it's not always obvious uh what's the best route to, to take. So the approach we took was this, we said, okay, let's build these models. And the models turned out to be rule induction models because they wanted to understand why very clearly, uh, why the um, uh, invoices were selected or are kicked out. So we built these uh, rule models and the very highest scores for purchasing the invoice they were just automatically, they'd go through. Because those are obvious cases. We don't need a person wasting even a minute of their day looking at this invoice to say yes or no. And the ones at the very bottom, they were easy to flush out. Those those also, the model said, almost no uh, chance that this will be a successful outcome for you. So you throw those out. But then you've got the way you described the squishy middle. You've got those that are like, maybe, and these aren't the actual percentages, but just for the purposes here, like 30 to 70% uh, success rates. Those really need somebody else to look at because obviously there's data that is available or that humans can infer that may not be readily available in digital form. That's really what's what's going on. And so well, humans can look at that and make the call, uh, but that reduces the workload. So they can go through way more invoices by chopping out these ones that are easy to focus on the ones that are hard. Let me pause here for a second just to help everybody picture the setup here. So, you know, there's rule induction and decision trees and all these techniques. But basically what's happening is you're feeding all the data to the machine learning algorithm and it's coming back with if then statements. OK, so the other thing I wanted to help people picture is that if you build a really fantastic model, what we hope for, what we cross our fingers and hope for as modelers is that we get this U shape you know, where we have a lot of 0.8 and 0.9s, where the that score is so high, uh, what we call a propensity score, that we just say, wow, this is not a risk. Let's approve this loan, okay? A 0.1 or a 0.2, again, we want that U-shape because we want lots of very high and very low scores. The very low scores, we just say, no, we can't, we can't do this loan. You represent too much risk. But what we're calling the squishy middle uh, is those scores around 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and that's potential lost income. There could be good loans sitting in, right. rather they're hiding in there. So we want to approve them, but we don't want to approve them if they're gonna if they're gonna default. So that's where the human comes in. So um, I think you were saying that one of the things that you might have to do is you might have some handwritten PDF. Uh, in fact, Carol was kind enough to ask the question, could you, uh, could we elaborate on feature engineering and unstructured data? And Carol, I wanted to address that now to some extent. One of the things you might be looking for is whether the cargo is perishable. Mm -hmm. But the way to do that is a photocopy of a handwritten, you know, so it's a PDF, but it's a mess. Yep. And that might be. So I know that James Taylor, our friend and colleague, loves to bring this up that people think, well, executives think, executives think that what the human is supposed to do in this situation is the model says 0.8, but some VP says, no, no, I, I want to decline that one, even though the model says 0.8 or 0.9. But that's kind of defeating the purpose. If we're going to build this model, we want to use it. 
where the human is incredibly valuable is in that range between like 0.4 to 0.6, where the model's not giving us a clear cut answer. Uh, so I mentioned your know, perishable foods. Could you think of some other examples from the model that there was some data hiding in there that was maybe hard to read, but that would tip the scales? Do you, can you think of any more? Yeah, I'm thinking, I mean, the, some of the biggest factors with this model were it's obviously some of the things you think are obvious are just history uh, with the um, with the truckers themselves. How many invoices had been successfully purchased in the past? How many times have they, uh, has there been some a big problem with the delivery or that the uh, pay, uh, the payor uh, that they delivered to just never paid the invoice? You know, because that's that's part of this really two parts of the problem. It's the trucker. Yes, and the, the the cargo, but it's also assessing the company that's supposed to pay the invoice, and how reliable that company was, and how able were they to pay uh, the invoice. So, uh, I can't think of anything just off the top of my head, like more PDF uh, related, where that would be subtle. But I want to bring up something that you talk about the point eight uh, kind of effect, and I do see this happen. This happened with the special forces. Uh, it happened to some degree with this uh, uh, purchasing the invoices example, where there will be individuals who, uh, you know, ex experts who look at that point eight and they say, look, I've seen this before, this this kind of pattern, like this company, and don't buy it. You know, or the flip side with the special forces, they were saying, what about the Rudys? You know, what about those people that nobody thought they would make it through, right? Yep. But they do. You know, and but the answer to that is that the advantage of machine learning is because we see all these examples. They're thinking of a single event. And when we say it's 0.8 likely, that means it's only 0.8 likely to be successful, which means 20% of the time it yeah. won't be successful. So you could say this one won't be successful, but if you apply that rule to the entire population, you're dropping 80% of that pattern that really would have been successful to save the 20% that you have a particular issue with. Mm. And so you end up losing money overall. Just like the Rudy's say, yeah, we can get the Rudy's, but for every Rudy, there are 19 other guys that look to us just like that who will wash out. And so it's that trade-off, the risk trade-off, because that's, that's where misclassifications occur contradictions in the data, the exact same pattern is associated with both outcomes. And what we're trying to assess is how frequently is it associated with the good versus the bad. And the machine learning algorithms are good at doing that. But that's that's what I try to communicate back to the stakeholders, say, yes, you're right, but this is the monetary impact it's going to have if we go with what you just said. Is that acceptable? Absolutely. So there's four buckets, I think it's fair to say. We can say that we've got true positives, the model said it's a good loan and it was a good loan. And then all the other combinations, like the model yep. says it was a good loan and it wasn't and so on. So you have your true positives, your true negatives and so on. A lot of folks are probably familiar with that. And I think for a stakeholder, for an executive, they really want to understand the monetary impact of those four. So here we go. I want to, I want to have you imagine that you're in a scenario here. Um, you're an external resource as we've both been over many, many years. You're advising the data science team at this um, uh, uh, freight invoicing uh, you know, company or invoice advancing company. And the data science team says, you know, if, if, if you could just give us another six months, we could squeak out another quarter percent of accuracy because we're going to do some text mining and we're going to do some other things. So let's not deploy now. Let's wait until next calendar year to deploy, right? Mm -hmm. what, what kind of advice would you want to give that they, they, they can deploy now? And, and, how do you actually walk them through what the incremental improvement looks like from a business standpoint? Yeah, I, almost always. And I don't say always because we know there's always exceptions. They're not always exceptions, but there's, you know what I mean? From Bayes, like, what's a joke about the Bayesian says being a Bayesian means never have to say you're sure because you never know completely what's going to go on. But in these situations, I like to tie it to dollars. Uh, because that's something that most stakeholders care most about. So that quarter percent improvement, we could spend six more months um, working these models to improve it by that little bit, or we could be 
pushed by someone to say, keep on going, keep on going. So there are two things that are at work here. One is how much incremental monetary value is there for that ex additional quarter percent? It may be substantial, may be worth it. The other part of that, what is the opportunity cost to not deploying the model now? How much revenue are you losing right now if you don't uh, deploy something that will be at least somewhat useful? One of the things I see, especially data scientists do, when they're because they're pushing so hard for accuracy, it's more frequently to occur on the data science side than the uh, business side. The business side, I my experience is they're much more likely to try to let's go with what we got right now because let's yeah. we we want to make money now. The data science say no, I could do better, I can definitely do better. But sometimes you build like a gazillion models to get some small improvement. And there's a difference between statistical significance and operational significance. So statistical significance would say, yes, there's a material difference statistically between these two models. But then operationally, maybe it only generates an extra two grand in revenue each month. And you're spending, you know, 10 grand on consultant time or your or your expense just to find that two grand. So no. there's that trade-off, which is really important. You know, we've both gotten the following question a thousand times, Dean, and that is um, uh, how accurate does my model have to be? Often being asked by the data scientist, you know, what's a level of accuracy that's good? And, and I don't know what exact answer you give, but we've been in this conversation so many times with folks. The answer is we have to do better than last year, right? So the you just incremental improvement from a business standpoint. We have to justify the, uh, yeah, Adrian just said accuracy is, is accuracy the enemy of the good, or rather the, the, the quest for the, for that perfect model, if it means delaying deployment does mean that the perfect model is the enemy of the good. Absolutely. That's uh, exactly yeah. what I think the phrase. So I think the thing to do is if you've got that squishy middle, you know where the squishy middle is. The model is telling you that. The model, yeah. the model isn't able to tell you give the loan or don't give the loan. It's not capable of that yet. Give the data scientists another try and we'll improve the model in a year. But at the moment, you know what the squishy middle is and you also know, <laughs> you know why it's squishy, right? Because usually it means because uh, a, something wasn't legible or something hasn't been addressed. So again, where the human gets used most effectively during deployment isn't to second guess the propensity score, but to provide the information that was missing that caused the prediction to be on the fence. That way we can go to market with the model now. We don't have to wait because we know exactly what we have to do. We just have the model right. and humans working together. And then as the model gets better, that squishy middle shrinks in size and we can refocus that um, that, that human resource elsewhere. Yeah, well, and we're gonna tie it back to the special force example, because there's another part of it, kind of that what's happening under the surface, sometimes one of the phenomena with the special forces selection, when guys would, uh, would fail, it's because you'd have enlisted in officers in the same group. Uh, they're all going through training together. When officers failed, it had a much more deleterious effect on the whole class because the officers are leaders, right? And so yeah. when the leaders fail, it demoralizes more people. So there is higher costs associated with bad selection of the officers. So you have to be especially careful about that level. So there are, th but those things, they're not obvious when you start, as you go through and see where does the model do well, where does it miss? Which ones are you surprised at it at missing? It's when you start looking at that and thinking about what information do we not include in our original columns in the data that would help us. And that's where you ask the subject matter experts. So asking the subject matter experts is critical at the beginning of the project. So you know something about the context, you know what variables you should be looking at. But then they don't always think through the details until you come back to them with stories. You say, we're missing these uh, examples. Why do you think, what What would you have done to get those right? Or what do you see in those examples? I did this with uh, building models of the IRS. We asked subject matter experts and they would, I remember sometimes I'm saying, um, when I asked them, which line items do you look at? And they, uh, this is before e-file, mandatory e-file. And so only some of the line items would be transcribed. And uh, they would say, oh, I look at these line items. I said, well, I don't have those. I only have these. 
the ones that are transcribed. What would you do with those? He says, well, those are garbage. I mean, I would never use those. I said, okay, they're, I know they're garbage, but that's all we've got. What would you do with these to mimic the best way possible these others? That's when we started getting good features out. When he was forced to think through with the data we have right now, what's the best way to contextualize it for the models? So those conversations are important at the beginning to define, but then along the way to see where the models are failing unexpectedly so that you can improve the models as we talk about the that iteration process, adding more variables or more kinds of variables to capture information that is not as readily available, whether it's PDFs or completely new data sources. Well, and... And one of the things that I want to focus on, as you know, is those instances, and they, they are not rare, where the information that you're trying to grab is really not obscure. For instance, I, I don't think it, when we were trading war stories, and I don't mean that uh, literally, I'm saying that metaphorically, although it's funny, you, you needed a clearance to be on that one, and I'm, I'm the... I'm the one of the the two of us that was in uniform uh, briefly when I was, uh, yeah. when I was in, in in college. So it was uh, it was fun to hang out with those guys. But um, what I want to say is, you were telling talking about a different example where sometimes you just had to verify that the applicant was a real person. I don't think that was necessarily the trucker, but sometimes you just have to go in there and say, "Is this does this business really exist?" Have they filed the appropriate places? Or are they listed on the Better Business Bureau and so on, right? So that oh, might sure. not trucker loans, but other ones. So there can be things that are more complicated than text mining would be good at. Not mm -hmm. the least reason of which pulling text from social media is a nightmare. It's not that it, it can't be done, but you know, those kinds of things where sometimes it's not a trivial amount of training that's involved, but we're not talking pilots and doctors necessarily either. That middle ground, that's where I think having, um, you know, a managed workforce is very helpful because it could be, are any of these items perishable? Does right. this business real, is there evidence that this business really exists? I remember one, you know, I had a, I had an invoice fraud project that I worked on myself it was for a big cancer hospital that actually a lot of folks would probably recognize the name if I shared it. But um, when we looked at what department the invoice represented, uh, kind of a funny story of that one. It was uh, they were trying, and this was in the in the New York Times, so I can I can relay the story because it was said publicly. But what they were fighting against was somebody had been ordering too much photocopy toner and then reselling it, so they ordered too much they re took it from the building and then they sold it. And that was hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's what inspired the project. Believe it or not, you can you really yeah. can get hundreds of thousands of dollars, which you then of toner, or you, then you sell on the, on the black market. But the most common department, I'm gonna put you on the spot, uh, Dean, can you guess, right? You're gonna go down here, you're gonna basically put, um, why was this, uh, why was this invoice put in for office supplies or whatever? What do you think, this is a cancer hospital, what do you think was the most common category? Of cat in terms of categories, uh, a category of uh, you know, like the department or uh, the reason code, basically the most common reason code. Again, picture cancer hospital. You 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 probably won't be able to guess, but you'll laugh when you hear it. Oh, other. Uh, what was it? Other and and second most common was miscellaneous. Yeah, sure. And look, fraudsters are really worried, worried they, they worried know, somewhere. Exactly, yeah. they know but where the lazy with the drop down menus. Yeah. Yeah, I was seeing the same thing with, uh, I was building models for the defense finance and accounting service, the uh, government accountants. And and with credit card, with the, with the government credit cards, which at that time were called impact cards, where you get some credit limit. And that was one of the keys, is you had a, uh, a per purchase limit. And you could see when people were making a purchase that exceeded their authority by breaking it up into multiple purchases. And so you could see when they're getting close to the limit of a single purchase, and they had multiple purchases in close temporal proximity that exceeded their dollar amount for one purchase. And so you have, that was a really good feature to know when they were uh, misusing the card, but it wasn't obvious. You, you couldn't get that at the transactional level. You had to create a new feature you had to aggregate the data uh, up a level in order to see those kinds of patterns. And that's what they're counting on that at the transaction level, at the individual line level, you wouldn't see it. Um, I, I was smiling. I don't know if you, you noticed, uh, not only to what you were saying, but also Ayusha says miscellaneous expense is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> and you're right. Yeah. 
So I can totally picture that if you had a propensity score that was on the fence and reason code was miscellaneous or other, if that got routed to a human and you ferreted out what it really was, because there's probably some description, like if it's ink pens, it's not a mystery. You know that ink pens aren't, uh, you know, a critical supply in the operating room. You could ferret out what that code should have been, feed right. it back to the model, and that might be the difference between a propensity score of 0.45 and a propensity score of 0.85, that miscellaneous or that other. And we both know that, probably not, you know, in, the, in this particular case, but we know that there are times when the bad guys who are up to no good, figure this out. Mm -hmm. And they purposely leave something blank. I'm sure that on the IRS project, for instance, you had to take something not reported on the form as data. Because mm -hmm. when somebody is asked to provide something and they don't, that's a data point. Missing, missing values in this context can be very predictive. Just the fact that they're missing. Yeah. Uh, and that's why encoding missing values with the dummy variable sometimes is, a, especially in fraud detection, I've seen, uh, can be a really good thing. Yeah, you know, just to, and just to tie this back, what we were talking about before with the iterative process, it could be that this other thing, and let's make it a little more complex, like the miscellaneous, the other, it could be just the fact that someone checked the other box in of itself is not predictive of anything. That main effect. What is interesting is what they put in the other. Like maybe they don't put anything in the other. They don't explain it. You know, so it's an interaction effect that matters. And it would be critical for the data scientist to be able to encode that in a way that the algorithms could then leverage that to associate with whether it's fraud or not. But that's something that, you know, sometimes there's this view that, like you talked, circling back to the very beginning, take all the data, just dump it in the hopper and let the machine learning algorithms figure it out. It's really, that's a very, very difficult problem. Uh, the data scientist, one of the most important things for data scientists to do is to organize the data in a way that give the algorithms every chance to succeed, uh, which means whether it's, you know, the missing values, creating features, all those, all those kinds of things that we do that take so much of the time are really important. It's not just a matter of pouring the data in and letting them figure it out, even if, You've got like a deep learning network that is a universal approximator that in theory can find any pattern that in reality they don't. <laughs> well, again, to, to circle back on themes that we've been talking about for the full um, hour, um, you might start with encoding missing data as missing. And even though it's missing, you might achieve a 0.9 or a 0.1, that sought after U shape, you know, that we were right. talking about. But if the value is missing and it falls into that squishy category that we've been talking about again and again, what you do is you don't delay deployment. You act on that now. You route that to someone that can figure out what the missing value is or clarify it so it falls out to the squishy, it falls out of the squishy category and into either the 0.9 or the 0.1. And if the data scientists want to roll up their sleeves and come up with a more complicated way to handle that a year from now, Go for it, but you don't delay deployment. That's what everybody wants to do. They keep on postponing and postponing and postponing until the model is perfect and it doesn't make any sense. You're not gonna get right. value that way. And if you're concerned that, I mean, most often models, at least in the like fraud detection or customer analytics or like the IRS examples, you're scoring everybody, but you're only operating on a subset. You're, you're treating a subset of that. And so how deep you go with the treatment will depend on, you're talking about that you, what that, uh, uh, what that really means for you as an organization. But that doesn't mean you keep, don't keep on learning. So once you deploy, then you get feedback from what happened when you deployed to understand the data better and improve your models. That's this is a whole nother topic. And we've bemoaned this, that there's no book on deployment out there uh, that to help you through think through all these different aspects of deployment. I don't mean just infrastructure, but I mean from a machine learning standpoint too, yeah. uh, to uh, to have your model applied over and over again. Yeah, no, but that, that's, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was, I was just gonna say that 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 is indeed a huge problem. But you keep on you know talking about identify the problems and then circle back. That could mean 
looking at a stack of personnel records and these other things to find out why did these turn out to be false negatives? Why did these turn out to be false positives? So it's almost like the training phase all over again, where you might have to do text processing or annotation and so on. So with just a couple of minutes to go, I want to really encourage people to come up with a couple of great closing questions. We might have time for as few as one. And while I'm waiting to see if we get some or even uh, Meaningly reasonable questions would be. <laughs> but while while I'm scanning the comments here, waiting to see if a couple of new questions pop in there, you try to you know have that really interesting final question. Anybody who's up to the challenge, but what I want to do is I want to mention that someone that uh, Dean and I are both know is going to have a similar conversation with me at the end of next month. I'm very much looking forward to that. So in terms of some action items that you should do, is please be open a new window right now and make sure that you're following Cloud Factory so you know about these future events. And while you're at it, go ahead and follow Dean and myself. And in February, I'll be talking to a gentleman named James Taylor uh, from Decision Management and also Ian Barkin from Sykes in March. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and find those folks. And if you have any trouble finding them, no worries because we're gonna have in the comments of this event after how you can sign up for an email list so you always hear about events like this, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, still looking for that one final question. Let me scan here. Going once, going twice. Me, while you're scanning for questions, let me yeah, I was give you a, a thing a, that well. I think one of the surprises, I think for data scientists, uh, when we're going through uh, the process, uh, our organizations, when they're going through the process of building these kinds of predictive models, is machine learning in the context we're describing is not a script. You know, it's not like a recipe where you just have, you do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then you're done. You know, it's more like Lewis and Clark on an expedition where nobody has gone before. Because oftentimes we're the very first people to look at the data to this level of detail and granularity ever. And so we're finding all the weird things in the data. We're like hacking our way through uh, the data to try to uncover interesting patterns. So you have to plan for and prepare for uncertainty, messiness. Algorithms are not particularly clever uh, and algorithms are not insightful and algorithms are completely naive. They believe everything you show them in the data, everything, they think it's exactly true. They're very concrete because it's just math because all they do is multiplication addition logic. But we, as the humans looking at this, as the machine learning professionals, we can look at the data and contextualize better and see where they're doing well and see where they're failing and help them succeed. Yeah, you know, just help everybody picture that. I think it's the data integration that usually doesn't happen until we come along, right? So they might have information on NCOs separate from officers, but until you bring them together, you don't make that really cool insight that an uh, officer that washes out then has a negative impact on the probability of success for the others on their, for the NCOs on their team. So if you were looking at them separately, doing visualizations or whatever you might be doing, kind of a more BI approach, you'd miss that until you match it all together. And that's why data prep, you know, takes so long. That's we right. Have in comments, um, the link to the Cloud Factory LinkedIn page. So again, the two things for you to do right now would be to follow Cloud Factory, then you'll know about these future events. And then the other thing for you to do is to monitor the comments because they will stay, uh, they'll stay up after we're done and do the mailing list for this series of interviews. Okay. Um, Costa asks, any tactics that you may have seen to work with to enrich these missing miscellaneous values? I wish I could give a more elaborate answer, Costa, because, but we're Just, so close to the end. 30 Go ahead. On, 30 on seconds. That. First of all, don't encode missing values the same way for every algorithm. The, because numeric algorithms like neural nets, logistic regression, they need things filled in. Decision trees don't necessarily need missing values filled in. So that's the first thing to be aware of. But also, the, my favorite way to encode missing values is with the model. If your software lets you build a model to predict, let's say you've got a column like age, and there are some missing values for age, if you can use the records where age is populated, 
to build a model from the other things that you know already to predict that age value and apply that model to those missing values, then you get a better imputation than just a straightforward mean or median imputation. And that, but this is worthy of like a half hour just oh, of course, you know, it, imputation. We could do a whole day on it. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I, I love that answer. I'm going to answer slightly differently, and I'm going to try to hold myself to 30 seconds too. And that is what I would do is go ahead and go to market with that miscellaneous and that other. Don't let it delay you. Go to market with that, but route those cases, especially when they're squishy to someone that maybe has to read a paragraph or call something up on a system or look something up on social media. That's what you do initially. Don't rush to do something fancy like text mining because it's going to delay you for months. Mm -hmm. I hope I made it under 30 seconds there. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this, Dean. I hope everybody else did as well. And the conversation will continue in comments. So follow Cloud Factory. Follow us, certainly, if you like. And also sign up for those future events, James Taylor next month and Ian Barkin in March. Thanks, everybody.